Hello, my name is Richard Chaffer and I'm a radiation oncologist and medical director of Extral. On behalf of Extral and our CEO, Adrian Treverton, I would like to welcome you to today's educational event on radiotherapy for inflammatory conditions. When I first started treating patients with radiotherapy to benign conditions, I found it hard to find reliable, clear and peer reviewed evidence and practical information about how to deliver these treatments. Working closely with the session chairs, we've designed this educational event to start to close that gap. We did hope there would be a lot of interest in this topic, but we've been overwhelmed by the amazing response with more than 700 people registered for today's session. We'll be hosting another educational event tomorrow on the topic of radiotherapy for hyperproliferative disorders, and also on Friday on the topic of radiotherapy for benign skin disorders. Separate registrations are required, so if you'd like to attend, please visit our website to learn more. Registration is still open. Although we have a very comprehensive program today, there were many aspects we couldn't cover this year, and we'd really like your help with thinking about what this could look like moving forwards. At the end of today's session, we'll be emailing you a very short survey. We'd appreciate it if you could complete it so, so that we can understand what we've done well and what we could improve on. Also, please let us know what else you think we should include next time and how often you think we should hold these events. I'd also like to take this opportunity to announce the formation of a new organization, the International Society for Radiotherapy for Benign Conditions, or ISRBC. We'd like to understand your views on how you think the society could help you with your clinical practice. So we've included a question in the survey about this. At the end of the survey, you'll receive a certificate of attendance. If you need a certificate of attendance, please make sure you complete the survey because the process is automated and it's the only way to receive a certificate. Now some housekeeping. At the end of each talk, there will be a live Q&A with the panelists, moderated by my colleague, Christian Moby from Extral. You can use the question section of the GoToWebinar platform to submit your questions during the presentation, and the speakers will answer them at the end of each section. Also, we'll be recording this session and we'll email you a link to the recording sometime next week. And with no further ado, I'll hand you over to, to today's session chair, Professor Oliver Ott. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation at this meeting organized by Extral. And uh, I will make the start with uh, a talk on low dose radiotherapy, the state of the heart. I want to show you, in my opinion, what is going on with low dose radiotherapy. This is a device. Uh, this is an extra device. This is a device as we use it in our department in Germany, in Erlangen. So I want to go um, in the talk. So as you all maybe know, uh, low-dose radiotherapy for benign conditions is a controversial issue. In some countries, it's accepted for more than 100 years. Uh, for example, in Germany, in other countries, uh, it's regarded as harmful, for example, in the Netherlands or the United States. So, what is why is it controversial? This is I want to show it in the next minutes. So, what about the evidence for radiotherapy for benign inflammatory degenerative muscular skeletal conditions? First of all, I want to start with our own trial. It's a randomized trial with more than 1,000 patients, and I want to explain it to you in the beginning. Um, so we randomized patients to two schedules of radiotherapy with six times 0 0.5 grays with two times a week in three weeks, and we randomized it to six times one gray in three weeks and made a re-evaluation of the pain after six weeks, and then we applied a second series if necessary, uh, with again in the arm A, six times 0 0.5 grays, in, in the other arm, six times one gray. So in the one group, they had about 12 grays cumulative dose, in the other group, six grays. 
and then we made another pain evaluation um, six weeks after radiotherapy and a long-term evaluation after two and a half years. And so we included more than 1,000 patients. Some dropped out and in the analysis we had 1,080 patients, more than 500 in the in the arm with 0.5 gray single dose and the same in uh, 1.0 gray single dose. And we included patients only with uh, heel pain, calcaneodynia or achillodynia, the sh with shoulder syndrome and elbow syndromes. And here are the results. We had a, a dedicated pain score and to summarize it, here you can see the early response and the delayed response and the long-term response. These were three times of evaluation. Early response is directly after the last radiation. Delayed response six weeks, six to eight weeks later in the follow-up visit. And for the long-term response, we sent out a questionnaire two and a half years later. And this is what we got uh, as the answers. And you can see the response rate is a combined, complete and partial response of the pain, of the initial pain. And right after radiotherapy, you can see that 84% of the patients said uh, it's uh, the pain um, was better. And uh, six to eight weeks after radiotherapy is what it was 87%. And in the long-term analysis, two and a half years later, it was open 90% of the patients. So you see the response is increasing with time. This is well known. And if you look to the no change or non-responders, it was right after radiotherapy, 16% and 8% um, um, after two and a half years, we received letters of more than 700 patients. So um, you see that there's quite a good, it, it's quite effective, the low-dose radiotherapy for this kind of conditions. And what, you, what else is very interesting, right after radiotherapy, the complete response is only 5%, and this increases up to nearly 50% of complete response with time. So this is quite a nice finding. The majority of patients benefit from this kind of therapy. And parallel, we did another um, endpoint analysis as well for pain with the visual analog scale. And we measured uh, from zero to 100. And here you can see the baseline values. Um, before radiotherapy, after the first series, before second series, after the last radiation, six to eight weeks after radiation and after two and a half years. And what you can see that it's steadily going down and the lower the rates, the less the pain. So it's another point that it's working very good. It's effective and uh, What's very important that you can see a difference between 0.5 grays and 1.0 grays. So uh, to give uh, only the half of the dose is the same as effective as one gray. This was a very important finding. And therefore in Germany, we, we usually um, apply single doses of 0.5 gray for this kind of problems. And uh, if you show to the details afterwards, uh, the further treatments after the low dose radiotherapy in follow up, and there were some treatments, manual therapies, medication, surgery, radiotherapy again, and so on. And there was as well no difference between the two arms, and this supports 0 0.5 grays. Uh, would you recommend radiotherapy for the patients in the two arms? There was no difference at all. And 
both arms were equally effective. So in this slide, I summarized um, randomized trials um, focused on single dose. Here you can see uh, two Netherlands, uh, two trials from the Netherlands with, uh, uh, with not a very big patient a sample size. And after three months, there was no um, difference between six times one gray versus sham placebo. And there was another trial for a hand osteoarthritis, and it was the same. In, uh, there were some trials for calcaneodynia, heel pain, and there was no significant uh, difference as well as in our trial. And uh, the only trial that was that showed a significant benefit uh, regarding single dose was uh, a random, a small randomized trial from Germany, randomizing six times one gray. Uh, versus six times 0 0.1 gray. And there was some benefit for this arm with more dose. So I showed you some randomized trials against placebo and against various single doses. And there's no, no uh, clear picture. So we have to take a closer look uh, so I want to show you some trials. It begins in these early 70s with a Swedish trial, and it's, it was a double-blinded trial with approximately 400 patients, more than 400 sites, with various entities, variable dose concepts, short follow-up, and this trial, double-blinded trial, showed no effectiveness for low-dose radiotherapy. And it was the same with a Finnish trial, uh, the same design, um, not very standardized, and about 100 patients not effective in this double-blinded study. Again, and uh, this is the German trial for the heel pain. 62 patients randomized with calcaneodynia. This is what I told you before six times one gray versus six times uh, 0 0.1 gray in three weeks and after three months there was a benefit and, um, and after 12 months more benefit and i will not go into the details because we will get this in the next speech from richard Schaffer. so um there's another trial, randomized trial from Turkey from 2015 with 128 patients, again with heel pain or foot pain. And uh, they randomized radiation therapy against steroids. And here, low dose radiotherapy was superior for six months at least. And also, as well for this trial, we get the details. In a few minutes, I will skip this. There's an English trial, just to complete the picture, with 40 patients randomizing low-dose radiotherapy for plantar fasciitis again, uh, with platelet, uh, by, uh, randomized versus platelet-rich plasma. And no, in this trial, there was no benefit shown for low-dose radiotherapy. And now we go on to the more current randomized trials. I already mentioned the two trials for the uh, um, hand osteoarthritis and knee osteoarthritis. Let's have a look to the hand osteoarthritis trial with these 55 patients. Randomized lotus radiotherapy, six times one gray versus sham. At three months, there was no difference. At the response at three months was the primary endpoint, and there was no difference um, for low dose radiotherapy against sham. And secondary endpoints, they analyzed very well um, um, 
MRI images and ultrasound images and uh, laboratory endpoints, and they do, did not find any um, differences between the two arms. Here, the results as a picture, here is the proportion of responders. And here at three months, you see between sham and low-dose radiotherapy, there was no difference. After one month, there was a little bit advantage for low-dose radiotherapy, but after three months, there was no benefit. And in this trial, the conclusions of the Dutch people were no benefit and we cannot advise it low-dose radiotherapy for the use for osteoarthritis of the end. And in the second trial from the Netherlands, uh, focusing on the knees, um, we, we have the same results. So, sorry, in the beginning, I, I already showed you the results for the knees, and it's the same for the fingers, and the hand osteoarthritis trial is the same results, no benefit at three months. Shame was even a little bit better, and uh, but it was not significant and uh, the conclusions are the same. No benefit and we cannot advise it as a treatment for and knee osteoarthritis. So there's another randomized trial that is not published yet but will be published in a few weeks. Um, it's a German trial on knee and hand osteoarthritis and they randomized six times 0 0.5 grays again versus six points 0 0.05 grays. Uh, so standard dose versus approximately nothing. And uh, yeah, it's not published. I cannot show you the results. So where are we now? I showed you uh, randomized trials and uh, I just want to summarize it. Uh, we have a huge body of evidence that clearly proves the effectiveness of lotus ray therapy for musculoskeletal skeletal, uh, conditions. But the data, as I showed you from the randomized trials, is, not, is really not convincing. And therefore, this is my opinion, the time has come to initiate randomized trials with clearly defined treatment schedules convincing endpoints and standardized response evaluation, and of course, adequate sample sizes. So we have some work to do, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ott. Um, as Dr. Shafford mentioned in the beginning of the session, we'd like to go ahead and open it up to Q&A. I'd like to kick it off, Dr. Ott, with a quick question around the controversy. I think you highlighted some of the, the controversy with respect to some of the, the clinical results that you're getting compared to the randomized clinical trials. Do you have any other observations regarding the use of low-dose radi radiation therapy in certain countries versus others that you can share with our attendees? Uh, yes. Um... In most German-speaking countries and some other European countries, for example, in Spain, it is very popular and thousands, tens of thousands of patients were treated every day, uh, whereas in other countries they try everything to um, eliminate this kind of, uh, of, of radiation for benign diseases or conditions. and um, yeah, it depends on the, uh, the school that you are from or what you think about radiation um, in benign diseases. And uh, so uh, it, it, it's in the end, it's radiotherapy, it's uh, ionizing radiation, and uh, this is maybe in theoretical. Um, point it's it's harmful but in our experience in a lot of countries they see no secondary or no tumors as a consequence of this treatment and if you go to the literature you do not see uh, publications about the induction of malignancies and uh, therefore we think in germany that's a quite a safe treatment but 
uh, from a theoretical point of view, you can have a different opinion. And of course, we all want to uh, spare radiation where it is possible uh, using the Alara principle. And uh, yeah, we tried to do it, but uh, in the end, you have to decide if you want to use it or not. And we have a lot of happy patients here in Germany. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, what was the energy used for the treatments? Um, the energy, the, um, usually in our trial that I showed you, we used auto-voltage radiotherapy between 120 for the elbows, kV, uh, kilovoltage, up to 220 kV for um, for the shoulders and uh, yeah, the heel pain. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, how was the dose prescribed? Did you prescribe it to a volume or to a point? Um, we described the dose in our trial to the surface and uh, not to a volume. So this, was, this is no 3D planning uh, for comparable uh, it's not comparable to Linux therapy. We do not use the Linux and we do not use uh, pre individual pre planning. So we use uh, tables and points. Okay, thank you. Next question What is your preferred RT schedule? Is it six times 0.5 gray, two times weekly? Yes, that's it. Uh, and uh, we do this over three weeks. And then we have nowadays uh, a break of 10 to 12 weeks. We wait a little bit longer than in the trial I showed you because you've seen it's, uh, the response is increasing over time. And therefore we wait now um, 10 to 12 weeks. And in case of subjectively insufficient response for the patient, we advise a second series. And, uh, after six to eight weeks, we had we we had eighty percent of the patients with two series applied, and uh, nowadays we think it's a little bit less. Okay, um, there there are a number of questions around your treatment with ortho voltage versus mega voltage, so I'm I'm going to skip over those since you just answered those. Um, the next question is. Uh, is the response different in older versus younger patients? Um, it's there's no clear data for me. Um, I just can say if an inflammatory condition is quite acute, it's quite uh, prominent in in the in the pain. It the response is a little bit better, and we we treated some younger. Uh, uh, professional sportsmen from soccer clubs from the region here and usually they got one series and the pain was gone for the knees or the feet and uh, so we have some idea that younger respond a little bit better than older ones but I, I do not know data about this. Okay um, follow-up question to to that discussion uh, do you, what is the lowest age limit that you would deliver RT for inflammatory conditions? Would you cap it at 30 years old or do you treat younger adults? No, uh, for radiation protection issues, we limited up, uh, the youngest age is 40 years old. And this is what we wrote down in our uh, national guideline, 40 years is uh, for these benign situations. Okay, uh, next question is regarding um, uh, treatment with LINAC. Would you recommend 6-MV treatment with LINAC? This is done uh, by the majority of the German uh, centers because auto-voltage devices are not as popular as LINACs in Germany. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of publication about LINAC treatment and it's it, it appears uh, the same effective but there's no randomized data on this i cannot give more evidence on that 
Okay, um, next question is around your, um, your prescribed dose. Uh, just to clarify, did you prescribe the dose to the surface as well for the knee and shoulder treatments? Uh, no, that's right. Uh, it's, uh, we prescribed it uh, in the middle of the joint and uh, we used uh, two orthogonal um, beams and uh, yeah. And, okay. Uh, yeah. All right, next question. Um, are there any contouring guidelines for inflammatory conditions and immobilization? Uh, at the moment, it's... Uh, always said to include the whole joint with the uh, with the structures uh, that uh, are related to the joint um, and I know that experienced radiation oncologists are working on contouring guidelines but at the moment it's not uh, available in detail because one problem is if you irradiate inflammatory uh, conditions. You do not really know what the target is uh, in the uh, joint. And therefore, it's a little bit complicated to define um, uh, target volumes. Okay. Well, we have time for a couple more questions and then we need to move on to our next presenter. Um, the next question is, are there any other indications you consider to be acceptable off trial? Um, Usually in Germany, uh, in our daily practice, uh, we uh, use this as a routine treatment for calcaneodynia, for knees, uh, osteoarthritis, for uh, and sometimes uh, at the Lenox for uh, the for the uh, hip um, osteoarthritis. We do not use the auto voltage device for that because. Uh, of the penetration depth. And um, we use that uh, for the elbows, the fingers, uh, the hands, uh, for the shoulders, and um, that's it for the inflammatory uh, indications. We do okay. not use this for the spine or Morbus Bechterew or so. This is what we're not doing. We use this for um, fistulas and um, and of course, for the big topic of hyperproliferative diseases, but this will be discussed tomorrow. Correct. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. So, for all of the attendees, as Dr. Schaffer mentioned, we have another session tomorrow on hyperproliferative disorders. If you haven't already registered, you can do so at our website. So, final question um, Do you apply a third or fourth series after a year or two years or yes. re retreatment? Yes. Um, if we uh, if we had a response of the first or second series, if we've seen a real response to uh, a pain reduction that lasted for a significant period, maybe one or two years, and older patients are returning with again the same situation, we apply um, a third series and. Um, the minimum interval is six months. We always wait six months at our department um, for re-evaluation. And if we do a, a third series of another six times zero profile grace, we wait again six months for re-evaluation. And in some cases, when the age is quite high, we choose to give a, a fourth series. And if someone is 90 or above, I would give a fifth or a sixth series because I do not expect 30 years later an induction of cancer. Sure. All right. Thank you so much. Um, there are a few other questions which we'll save to the end, time permitting. Um, I would like to go ahead and move on to the next presentation for today's session. Dr. Daniel Rivas will be speaking on LDTR for gone arth arthrosis and Cox arthrosis, a randomized trial. And I will turn it over to Dr. Rivas. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and thanks to Extral for allowing me to share with you the preliminary results of our Clinica uh, trial. 
why uh, did we think about making a trial using low dose radiotherapy? There were several reasons. Our company is highly compromised with research overall when, when we can help improving the quality of life of many people because you all know arthrosis is a very prevalent disease worldwide, especially in Western society. It affects about 10-15% of people over 60. For example, in Spain, gonarthrosis affects more than uh, 5% of general population and Cox arthrosis affects almost 14%. The aging population is increasing and it is very usual to have morbidities that doesn't allow to use common treatments like surgery, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory agents, analgesics. But uh, all uh, per people and doctors usually are concerned of radiation-induced tumors and possible side effects caused by radiation despite the very low risk reported. When um, we read the DIGRO guidelines, they recommend using a total dose between 3 and 6 gray with a dose per fraction of 0.5 and 1 gray. We try to demonstrate that 3 gray has the same anti-inflammatory effect than 6 gray. So in the future, we can use the minimum recommended dose and minimize the already low risk of radiation-induced tumors. These are our objectives. The main one is uh, to research the non-inferiority of three gray versus C grays in knee and hip arthrosis in terms of pain. We use uh, the visual analog uh, scale for this measure. And the secondary objectives were to clarify the effectiveness of the treatment in general and prolocation, to collect the side effects, to know about the quality of life improvement, and to clarify if our patient reduced the quantity of analgesics. This is the visual analog scale, and as you all know, it is very easy to use for all the patients, and it is validated for the scientific community. And here we have the Quest Ontario and McMaster University questionnaire for knee and hip in its Spanish version from the Spanish Society of Knee. This questionnaire has uh, three sections. One for the intensity of pain, a second part uh, to measure the stiffness of the joint, and the last part to measure the functional capability. What about the design of our trial? It's a non-inferiority trial, so we are waiting a non-statistical difference between the arms of the study. All our centers in Genesis Care Spain have participated. It is a prospective study and randomized in two groups, and only the patients did not know in which group they were being treated. This is our uh, decision algorithm, where there are two important steps. Here, with the first randomization, uh, at three or six grade, when the uh, patients came to the uh, baseline visit, and another one here, in the uh, three gray group uh, when uh, they need um, uh, to repeat the treatment uh, eight or 12 weeks after the first treatment. Um, how did we select the patients? Our inclusion criteria were people over 50, at least one year of arthrosis evolution to be treated with usual treatment previously or to have comorbidities that made these treatments impossible or not recommended, patients must be able to follow up and they had to sign an informed consent. And the exclusion criteria were to receive high dose radiotherapy previously in the location, connective tissue disorders, inherited hypersensitivity syndromes, and to participate in other clinical trials. And how was the development of the trial? Well, we had several difficulties. Uh, the study uh, was approved by two research ethics committees. This is the consequence for having many regional health systems in Spain. Patient recruitment started in May 2019. 
at the beginning, the recruitment was very slow because there is no tradition of low-dose radiotherapy for arthrosis in Spain, and we did not receive patients from uh, other doctors. It was very difficult to get patients. After that, we have another setback. COVID-19 pandemic appeared, and along the first wave, we have to stop the recruitment and wait until our centers were safe and COVID-free. As a result of the fear to COVID-19, we suffer other difficulties with uh, the follow-up and the treatment of patients. They didn't want to come to health center, so we had to do the follow-up by phone. We have to have to collect uh, all these data in the baseline data in the baseline baseline visit. Sorry, uh, uh, data like uh, birthday, gender, height, weight, body mass index, location of the arthrosis, previous treatment, uh, the visual analog scale, and the WOMA questionnaire. Uh, in the visit at the eight. 12 weeks after the finishing of the treatment, again, we uh, collect the BAS, the WOMAC questionnaire, data about the radiodermatitis, and uh, if the patient suffered any side effect, and if it was uh, necessary to repeat the treatment or not. And in the uh, six month visits, uh, again, we have to collect the BAS, the WOMAC questionnaire, data about the uh, possible radiodermatitis and um, uh, if uh, our patients took less medication or not if they uh, needed other treatments uh, since last visit and if they had uh, any side effects or not and finally our preliminary results uh, this is the distribution of patients by centers we have to highlight uh, three centers uh, where we treated the most of patients um, in Talavera de la Reina, Málaga, and Benalmádena. We treated more uh, women than men, 70% versus uh, 30%, approximately, uh, with an age, with a median age of 73 years. Uh, and we treated more uh, knees than uh, uh, hips with an 87% versus a 30, 13%. And uh, the BAS median was eight at the baseline visit, and the total WOMAC was uh, 54 of the median. This is a picture, a photography of what happened on uh, May uh, 31st, 2021. Um, uh, we finished the recruitment, and uh, in this uh, moment, we have recruited uh, 229 uh, patients. Um, 181 patients finished the treatment in this date and 110 had a six month visit of review and only a patient in this day did not finish the treatment. About the toxicity and the side effects, I, we have to say that uh, the treatment is very safe. Only has had uh, two radiodermatitis, one in each group, two cases of transient increased pain in the sixth grade group, in one case of venous thrombosis in right lower limb, again in the sixth grade group. And here you can see the BA, BAS evolution at the baseline and six months later with uh, improvement in the pain in more than 70% of the patients. Um, the Red line is uh, or uh, the 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 three grade groups. The green line is six grade group, and this is the general group. And you can see 
the same, but in a table where the you can see that the BAS evolution uh, is very similar without uh, not uh, without a stati statistically significant difference between the groups with very similar median values. The same happens with the BAS evolution after six months in terms of mean plus minus a standard error with where it is confirmed that not a statistically significant difference are found. Nevertheless, uh, it should be noted that exists a trend in favor of three great groups, which shows a greater decrease in pain, 49% versus 41%. And the same happened with the WOMAC questionnaire in terms of mean plus uh, minus uh, standard deviation. Uh, there are no statistically significant difference between uh, the two treatment groups. Here you have the, the P. In terms of median values of the WOMOC questionnaire is the same. There are no statistically significant differences between the two treatment groups. And the same for the uh, in terms of mean plus minus standard error, where the P is you can see the piece and there are no statistically significant differences found between the two treatment groups. In conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, three gray is not inferior than six grade. Both uh, doses are effective in both locations. Uh, we got an Im uh, improvement in a high percentage of patients. Uh, mm, there are no side effects uh, in 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 our uh, series. Only very few uh, uh, side effects. Um, um, in, only in grade one, and we got an improvement on the quality of life of the patient that was measured with GOMAT questionnaire, and the analgesic reduction analysis is uh, in process. And we can recommend uh, using lower doses, and of course, we have to recommend low dose radiotherapy in arthrosis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rivas. So the first question um, is: After um, you know seeing a response that's that's poor, do you repeat the treatment? Can you describe a little bit more about your protocol in that area? Uh, well, um, we we thought that uh, uh, a good score uh, is uh, when the, um, the uh, at least the BAS uh, reduce uh, about uh, two points uh, at least. Uh, but sometimes, if you have a, a very uh, low BAS, uh, this is um, it depends on the uh, on the, the the initial BAS. Uh, for instance, uh, you have uh, in the in the pictures in the slides that the range of the BAS goes to three uh, to until nine, if uh, I if I remember well. So if you have a BAS of three points, uh, the reduction in one point is very important. But if you have a, a BAS of uh, nine points, uh, if the reduction is one. Uh, point the reduction is not very important so uh, it depends on the on the baseline of the um, of the BAS and it's important to uh, to have the the um, the, po the 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 points uh, in the total and the and the part of the um, the pain uh, in the WOMAC uh, to um, think if it's necessary or not to repeat the treatment. This is uh, our uh, criteria for, for repeat the treatment or not. Okay, thank you. Next question uh, is regarding other treatments that are currently offered in Spain. Um, is systemic steroid anti-inflammatory or, or surgery offered as well in, um, in your practice in Spain in particular? Um, uh, the, 
the question is about uh, to 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 um, if uh, we affect surgery a uh, patient with surgery uh, uh, previously. I think the question is regarding any other additional treatments that you might be providing, such as systemic steroid, anti-inflammatories, or surgery in conjunction with radiation therapy. Uh, we try to, to uh, use uh, only uh, the radiotherapy um, and if, if necessary, uh, to to uh, if the pain is not uh, decreasing, uh, we try to uh, um, prescribe uh, analgesics, anti-inflammatory agents, uh, or or others. But uh, if finally, when you uh, get uh, the, 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 the finish of the treatment and there is no response in, in perhaps six, uh, six months or, or, or more uh, months, uh, then uh, it's possible to make after the treatment of the radiation, uh, you can uh, to make surgery or other uh, physical uh, um, treatments. Uh, because uh, the radiotherapy, uh, the low dose radiotherapy, um, is not a, um, um, is not um, a, a contraindication for the for others uh, treatments. Uh, and uh, never mind uh, if you uh, uh, were. Uh, um, or do, if you had a surgery previously, or if you, after the radiotherapy, are going to, to need a, a, a surgery, for instance, uh, for try to, 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 uh, to improve the, the condition. Okay, thank you. Um, and just a reminder to all the attendees, if you have any questions for Dr. Rivas, you can submit those questions using the GoToWebinar control panel. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and move on to the next one, Dr. Rivas. Where was the dose prescribed? Yes, uh, the, the the dose prescribed here uh, in the in the three grade groups it was uh, three uh, three grades uh, as uh, the total dose, and the single dose was uh, 0.5. And in the second group, that is uh, the sixth grade group, uh, it was um, six grades uh, in one grade per fraction. Um, we elect the uh, or we uh, cho chose um, this um, um, these doses because it's the 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 uh, uh, upper. And the and the lower um, the strengths of the total doses that the DECRO guidelines uh, recommend. Um, uh, how the 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 bias of the of the study was only for the for the patients. Uh, we need that uh, they have the same number of the of the fractions. So, uh, because uh, sometimes uh, our patients can uh, can talk in the in the waiting room, so uh, we need to to have the 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 same type of the of the schedule with the with the in in terms of fractions. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is um, also around the, the surgery and whether pa patients are receiving surgery. Um, were you tracking, um, in, in your trial, were you tracking the number of patients that received any kind of further surgical procedure? Um, ex uh, exactly, um, no. Mm, we don't have uh, the we, we know the number of the of the surgery but uh, it's not um, uh, uh, an, an objective of the of the of the treatment but it is is possible I think that it's possible to to see with uh, uh, with the if we talk with the, our statistic uh, specialist uh, specialist uh, to see that. 
but uh, in this moment we uh, we don't know uh, who is the um, uh, which is the the um, the the uh, these patients or or the follow up of this patient in concrete concretely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, back to the previous question, you had talked a little bit about the the dose, um, the prescribed dose. What location um, are you are you prescribing the dose? Is it to the skin or another location? Yes. No. I, I, we usually uh, we treat with uh, Linac, so uh, we use the same. Uh, quality of for uh, that we use in in, in malignant disorders. So uh, we uh, made the prescription uh, in the in a volume um, with the with the help of the of the CT scan. Okay. Yeah. The the next question was whether or not you had a preference for KV or MV um, for your treatments in the knee. Sounds like you're using a Linac. Well, I don't have um, experience with uh, orthovoltage, so um, uh, we have to or, or kilovoltage. So uh, we have to to use the uh, usually uh, we we treat with uh, six MV photons. Okay. Um, the next question is just a general question. I think it applies also to Dr. Ott's presentation. Um, can you speak about any randomized trials showing the effect of radiotherapy compared to sham treatment? Well, um, if uh, in in the in the trial of Mintem that is uh, randomized and, and we, uh, they compare with um, with sham. Uh, perhaps the number of the patients was uh, was not very high uh, because uh, it's, I don't remember, but it was about 14 patients, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the uh, the um, um, the, the the result was uh, for me uh, perhaps a, a little confused because um, the um, the sham the the the, the good response with with sham uh, was very high about fourteen percent of the of um, of the sham uh, with the sham um, perhaps in when when uh, uh, they uh, make the the um, the all uh, if I don't remember, but uh, they only treat with one phase, uh, only six uh, fractions, and if the um, the they don't uh, if the if they didn't have a, a good response, uh, they didn't repeat the treatment. So perhaps this is the difference between the the mm, this. Uh, this uh, trial with sham. Uh, I don't know uh, what is the the opinion of uh, 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 the rest of the panelists. Okay, thank you. We we can hold that till the end if we have time to address that question to to the rest of the group. Um, just one final question before we move on to our next presenter. Have you had any issues receiving reimbursement for these treatments? Um, for example, you know, as uh, perhaps this is characterized as an experimental treatment, are you getting reimbursed as a non-experimental treatment? Yes, no, uh, we offer these, uh, these treatments uh, free for patients because uh, we receive a, a budget from, from ELECTA um, because uh, uh, people here in Spain uh, and our uh, uh, colleagues from traumatology, traumatology re uh, rehabilitation, um, rheumatology, uh, it's very difficult that they send us uh, the, the they send us uh, patients. Um, so we have to to make a, a marketing. Um, a free program. Um, uh, we contact with uh, with several uh, 
rheumatologists and traumatologists and finally we get uh, we got uh, to to this number uh, to this high number of patients for, for the for the treatment okay thank but in, you. in general uh, sorry sorry in general uh, it's uh, sometimes it's very difficult that a patient here in spain uh, pay uh, this treatment uh, uh, in in the private way sure sure okay thank you for the background um I'd like to go ahead and move on to our next speaker for today's session. I'd like to introduce um, Professor Udo Goppel, who will speak on LDRT-associated mechanisms of pain control. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dr. Goppel. Yeah, also a warm welcome from my side and thanks a lot to Ixtral for setting up this special interesting clinical symposium on treating benign conditions with radiation therapy. And in my talk, I will particularly focus on osteoimmunological modes of actions of low-dose radiotherapy, which strongly contribute to the pain reduction of this uh, therapy. If we talk about osteoimmunology, we have to first to talk about inflammation and how is inflammation initiated. You see it on the left side, you have an injury, this could be microbes, this could be also a physical injury, and then you got the release of so-called um, pathogen or damage associated molecular patterns. And the first key immune cells which is activated is the macrophage. The macrophage secretes cytokines and chemokines and then attracts lymphocytes via the endothelium. And there we have the key cells you see on the right side, the macrophages, the lymphocytes and the endothelium. And research of the last two decades has revealed that particularly low doses between 0.3 and 1 gray impact on all of these cells. For example, macrophages get a more anti-inflammatory phenotype. The adhesion of immune cells to endothelial cells is reduced and we have an increased secretion of anti-inflammatory TGF better and generally activation markers on immune cells go down following low-dose radiotherapy. And this in sum then leads to pain reduction, increased mobility and increased quality of life of the patients. Just let me show some exemplary data on that. This is with human macrophages which got activated and afterwards irradiated with low doses. And you can see here the prominent um, inflammatory cytokine IL-1 beta. And you can nicely see that particularly a dose of 0.5 to 0.7 gray leads to reduced secretion of the cytokine. And most importantly, if you look at the active form, immunological active form, it's particularly decreased at the same dose. If we then proceed to animal models, and this is a model system now published since already 20 years from the group of Hildebrand et al. They looked in adjuvant induced arthritis in rats and nicely showed that even so at 0.5 gray, you see it in the white bars, the amount of macrophages is not reduced. They showed reduced expression of inos and reduced inos means less nitric oxygen and therefore less inflammation by the macrophages. And these data were then confirmed later on with another model system by Wunderlich and al. They used LPS activated peritoneal macrophages and you nicely can see in the dose range between 0.01 to 2 gray as a single dose, the phagocytosis is not affected by the macrophages. So they are less inflammatory but still full functional and Another positive thing is that particularly again after 0.5 gray, they show reduced transmigration to inflammatory sites, meaning you reduce in some the inflammation. So now we have the key cells macrophages which are involved and now go to the endothelial cells. You nicely can see on the left side that after irradiation of endothelial cells, PBMCs do less adhere to the endothelium, again particularly after 0.5 gray. And when we look for the mechanism, you see that after this dose, a B-phasic induction of the anti-inflammatory cytokine TGF beta-1, and this goes along with the activation of the uh, transcription factor NF kappa B. These were all um, in vitro ex vivo data and data inflammatory models of rats regarding the key immune cells, macrophages, and regarding endothelial cells. But we wanted to move on now to osteoimmunological modes of actions. And for that, we use in our laboratory the human TNF alpha transgenic mouse model. This is a mouse model where mice constitutively overexpress TNF alpha and they got swollen joints. 
And after a single dose of 0.5 gray, you see an improved grip strength of the mice over a long time period. And also most importantly, TNF alpha is significantly reduced systemically in these mice after low dose radiotherapy. A new point was now, if we look on osteoblasts, so cells which build up bone, we showed for the first time that after 0.5 gray, you see this here in this nice images with the red dots, we got an increased mineralization area on the bone concomitantly with OPG increasement. So this means not only inflammatory reactions are modulated by low dose radiotherapy, but also bone metabolism. And you even can induce a slight building up of bone again. When we then looked at MUCT images of these animals and looked at bone resorbing cells, so the osteoclasts, you see that the erosive area is decreased after low dose radiotherapy. You have a decreased osteoclast number. And you see this in the images with the red arrows. This is destructive area, which is reduced after low dose radiotherapy. So we can sum up here. We have actions on macrophages, endothelial cells, and on key cells of the bone metabolism, namely osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Then we went on for another um, inflammatory model for destructive arthritis. This is KBXN serum transfer model. The mice get more faster uh, uh, disease resembling osteoarthritis. You nicely can see here again the small joints. And then we were interested now what is going on if we irradiate these swollen joints. Again, we have our setup. You see this lead chamber, only one leg of the mouse is outside. This is a bit complex slide, let me guide through it. The control mice have two untreated legs. The low dose radiotherapy mice, they got irradiated just at one leg and the other leg is protected by the lead chamber. And now for the first time, very interesting data, which, which are just submitted for publication. On the left side, you always see the totally untreated mice, the basal level of immune cells, like dendritic cells, monocytes, and K cells and T cells in the bone marrow of the leg. If you irradiate the leg, you see a decreased amount of dendritic cells and also an increased amount of T cells. But what is now very new for low dose radiotherapy, when you look at the T cell compartment, even so the unirradiated leg of the treated mice, you see a reduced amount of T cells, increased CD4 positive T cells and decreased CD8 positive T cells. So what we know from radiotherapy of tumors, the so-called abscopal effect, so you irradiate one side and got systemic immune responses on the other side, is now for the first time shown also for low dose radiotherapy, that you have immunological impact on the non-irradiated areas in a beneficial way because you have more CD4 and less CD8 T cells. Um, the next point is, is this dependent on the basal inflammatory conditions? And I can tell you, yes, it is. Because again, these data I already have shown to you, after 0 0.5 gray, a reduced number of osteoclasts, so not so much disturbance of bone. But if you look at the same setting in healthy mice, without any inflammatory phenotype, you see no impact on this dose on the osteoclast number. So this is very important. Low dose radiotherapy acts on an inflamed tissue and it's harmful for healthy individuals. Finally, we wanted to see if we see systemic modulations also in patients. And for that, um, five years ago, we did set up the IMO LDRT01 trial. And it's a typical scheme of the patients. So they got six fractions, a 0 0.5 gray in three weeks. And we took blood before and after therapy. And if needed, the patients got as usual in the clinics, a second series of irradiation. And what are the results? First, shortly for the patient population, the most indications of this patients were calcaneodynia, but also around 20% patients having arthrosis or arthritis as usual most of the patients are over, overweight or even adipositas. More uh, female than male person are included because they have more um, chronic degenerative inflammatory uh, diseases. And now, what did we see? So on the left-hand side, we confirmed that the general pain level and the pain under load and the morning stiffness was significantly decreased during and after the therapy. 
And this effect was even more pronounced when we retrospectively asked the patients about their pain level. You see a strong improvement directly after therapy. And now for the first time, we found mainly for the morning stiffness that this correlates nicely with myeloidic cells in the peripheral blood, namely MDCs, type 1 and type 3 monocytes. The more of these antigen-presenting cells in a non-inflamed status are in the peripheral blood, oh, sorry, I have to go back. The more of these cells are in the peripheral blood, the less pain the patients do experience. And another important thing is that activation of immune cells like CD25, HLADR, and PD1 was also slightly but significantly decreased regarding the whole population. So we can summarize that low dose radiotherapy with particularly 0.5 gray has beneficial osteoimmunological modes of actions. And it mainly acts on inflammatory macrophages and endothelial cells. Importantly, the action is dependent on the inflammatory status. And we see in the patient study that low dose radiotherapy induces pain reduction in chronic degenerative and inflammatory diseases. And most importantly, the activation status of immune cells is shut down and cells of the monocytic lineage in a non-inflamed setting might predict the therapeutic outcome of low-dose radiotherapy. And for the future, this is really a challenge, but a very important perspective. We now need placebo-controlled trials to prove what we've seen preclinically in the mouse models and then the ex vivo settings, the osteomological modes of actions of low-dose radiotherapy in patients in comparison to really placebo effects. At the end, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm now really happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. So um, the first question for you is, uh, what is the upper limit of dose in LDRT? So uh, this is a good question. So from the biological point of view, um, when we talk about these LDRT, we talk about medium doses up to two gray. If you go further on, you will have totally different mechanisms. So meaning then you go in the dose range of cell death induction in the immune cells and also in the bone cells. So there are totally different things happening. So single doses, which are prominent, what we also know from the clinics is 0.5 gray and one gray. But in our preclinical model systems, we always go up to two gray as comparison. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is around um, potential misdiagnosis. If a patient is misdiagnosed and is healthy, uh, do you believe that radiotherapy is harmful? So, uh, what we what we showed, I can refer now from from our examinations to these uh, preclinical models that one important point is the low-dose radiotherapy mainly acts on a pre-inflamed or pre-destroyed tissue. So meaning when you are in a, when you're misdiagnosed and you're in a healthy situation, we've shown in some preclinical model systems that you do not strongly affect the immune compartment and the bone compartment. So meaning with this regard, it's harmful Regarding the long-term outcomes, Professor Ott already pointed out that for sure after low-dose exposure, you might get secondary tumors later on. And that's why the patient selections depends on the age and also on the uh, disease condition. Okay, um, that, that's actually a great segue to the next question. What number of patients were in this trial and can you discuss more about the age of the patient? Yeah, so this was also, also older patients. So uh, the medium age was about 60 years. And uh, it were now the data I've shown you in this LDRT01 trial. It's the interims analysis of 125 patients. And as you as I stated, it's a very heterogeneous patient collective because we took all the patients which are routinely treated. And you see also from the immunological modulations, again, RDRT is harmful because you don't basically change the whole immune system. It's very minor changes, but you see mainly changes in the activation state of immune cells. And this is very promising. But uh, what we can also say, if we make some first subgroup analysis, 
it also depends on the disease. So meaning when you have a more inflammatory component in arthritis diseases, for example, you get other modulations than when you have a more bone destructive component. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, do you always recommend the 0.5 gray fraction dose and stopping it with the one gray fraction dose in inflammatory conditions? So from the clinical data Professor Ott shows, it's very similar in general. So meaning then we recommend 0.5 break because you spare dose. And from the immune biological point of view, we strongly recommend 0.5 gray because this is a kind of, let's call it magic dose, because in this dose range between 0.3 and 0.7, and most prominently at 0.5 gray, we see the most beneficial effects on attenuation of inflammation. This was shown by the Rödel group for endothelial cells. And this was shown from, from other groups in our group for many inflammatory conditions. This was shown by Dr. Lisa Delock from my group, who's heading this part of the research uh, in our laboratory, um, that 0.5 gray has the most effect on osteoclasts and osteoblast. So let's say from the immune and osteological point of view, 0.5 gray is superior to 1.0 gray. Okay, thank you. Um, also, just a reminder to the attendees, if you have any questions, you could submit those to Dr. Gopal through the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, next question, Dr. Gopal, what level of energy was used for treatment? So this was the uh, same energy as uh, Dr. Ott already stated. So we used the autovolt technique to irradiate our cells and also the mice. Okay, great. All right, that was the final question. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next presenter. I'd like to introduce yeah. Professor um, Franz Rodel. Uh, he'll be speaking about COVID-19 and LDTR, current concepts and clinical results. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and X trials to provide me the opportunity to report on recent findings on the impact of low dose radiation therapy in COVID-19 pneumopathy with a special focus on first clinical results. Also, I do not consider it necessary to quote the worldwide impact of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in this audience. I would like to draw your attention to a huge cumulative number of more than 219 million infections and more than 17 million active cases of disease until the beginning of September this year. In addition, more than 4.5 million people so far died from COVID-19 infection and the numbers are still constantly growing worldwide. There, is, there are basically three stages or phases of the natural history of COVID-19 disease. The first phase is related to the onset of the disease and is mainly characterized by the development of influenza-like symptoms like fever or dry cord. Some individuals recover at this stage while others progress to the second phase. In the second phase, lungs are affected with pneumonia-like sy symptoms evidenced by lung obesities and dyspnea. Further, in dependence of the severity of phase two, patients can improve or worsen with the necessity for mechanical ventilation. These patients are typical examples for the phase three, which is characterized by hyperinflammation, respiratory distress syndrome, cytokine release storm, and sepsis of lungs. These patients require intensive care treatment and most of them unfortunately cannot overcome the infection and will die. Also, a multitude of drugs are included in the treatment of COVID-19 disease. There is still urgent need for an effective treatment of these patients. Thus, the question arises, is there any rationale to treat patients with COVID-19 disease with low-dose radiation therapy? The first evidence for an impact of irradiation on pneumonia arises from historical reports dated at the beginning of the last century. In 1905, Mercer and Edsel introduced radiotherapy as a plausible treatment for unresolved bacterial pneumonia. 
In 1924, Heidenhain and Fried reported on 233 pneumonia cases providing strong evidence that RD is superior to equine serum therapy resulting in an immediate improvement of patient symptoms. Finally, in 2013, Calabrese published a review on 15 reports covering more than 800 patients with severe pneumonia of different pathogenesis showing a beneficial effect of low-dose irradiation. They also included two experimental studies of viral origin and indicated good clinical response, indicating a reduction of mortality, usually with a short onset time of one to three days after irradiation. Moreover, over the last decades, our group and others have reported on a multitude of molecular mechanisms implicated in the anti-inflammatory and immune modulatory properties of low-dose radiation exposure. These activities cover a modulation of leukocyte adhesion to activated endothelial cells and a diminished adhesion molecule expression in line with apoptosis induction in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Moreover, Chemokine secretion, apoptosis, and protein kinase pathways are affected by low dose exposure on polymorph nucleated cells. Finally, macrophage activity, including cytokine interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha expression, release of reactive oxygen spaces mounting an oxidative burst, and the inducible nitric oxide synthase activity are hampered upon low-dose irradiation. Important and with relevance to the clinical studies as reported next, these activities display comparable dose-response relationships and the most pronounced effect in the dose range of 0.5 to 1 gray. Recently, Mitsiani et al. reported on a bivital impact of macrophages in a model of experimental pneumopathy in mice. They indicated that low-dose irradiation increases the immunosuppressive profile of lung macrophages during viral infection. By this, interleukin-6 and interferon gamma secretion from lung macrophages was associated with lung inflammation, while anti-inflammatory interleukin-10 secretion was low. Upon low-dose irradiation exposure, however, the equilibrium was shifted to a more anti-inflammatory response with increased levels of interleukin Keen 10, counteracting lung pneumonia in line with increased numbers of infiltrating immune cells. Also, there is experimental evidence on a putative positive impact of low-dose irradiation therapy in viral pneumopathy. There's a huge, there was a huge controversy on this issue last year. While some authors argued in favor of this therapy and reported on promises, others did completely neglect this approach and indicated treatment unacceptable due to a lack of supporting data with a letter to cover the risk of lung cancer induction or cardiovascular stress. Nevertheless, a variety of clinical studies have been initiated within the last year to investigate the impact of low-dose radiation therapy in the treatment of COVID-19 patients. The table depicts exemplary studies out of currently 19 registered on clinical trials. Of. These trials, located in different countries all over the world, are planned with a multitude of dose concepts covering doses from 80 centigrades up to 1.5 gray single dose applied to the lungs. Indeed, recently first results from some of these studies were published. Major findings are given in the tables presented in the next few slides. By this, I did display studies in favor of irradiation therapy grouped according to different dose concepts with increasing single doses applied to the bilateral lung irradiation. In more detail, by using those concepts of a single 0.5 gray exposure, authors indicated improvement of oxygenation, demand of oxygen supply, and clinical recover 
surgery in a huge number of patients, while others reported on radiographical improvements of these patients who survived COVID-19 diseases. In addition, by applying a single dose of 0.5 gray irradiation, Shambra et al. revealed a 90% success rate with a discharge from hospital within a range of 10 to 24 days after um, irradiation treatment. Moreover, other groups indicated chest X-ray severity scores to become significantly lower in the irradiated group, while overall survival after 28 days was 32% in the irradiated group and 11% in the control group. Samanent et al. further showed that oxygen saturation significantly improved three days after low-dose radiotherapy treatment, lung inflammation decreased one week after therapy, and seven out of ten patients recovered from severe pneumonia. Finally, has it all indicated shortened median time to clinical recovery to hospital discharge and lower intubation rates in line with, signif with, line with a significant reduction of hematologic, cardiac, and inflammatory markers? Importantly, these patients enrolled in the studies as reported so far cover an age range between 93 and 90 one years with patients requiring mechanical ventilation, uh, which were excluded from these trials. By contrast, a study not in favor of low-dose radiotherapy for the treatment of COVID-19 disease was restricted to generally elderly and comorbid patients with a medium age of 75 years and the necessity of mechanical ventilation, indicating more severe phases of the diseases. By comparing 11 patients being irradiated with a dose of one gray or sham treated, survival was estimated equal after four weeks of treatment. Author findings given before indicate a mainly positive effect of LDRT in the treatment of COVID-19 disease. Some further aspects should be taken into consideration and must be solved to answer the question, is LDRT an alternative treatment for inflammatory lung diseases? By this, during the past decades, research has addressed the issue of cancer risks for therapeutic X-rays. Cautious estimators suggest excess lifetime risk to be well below 1 to 2 percent. Another question covers the induction of virus mutations by irradiation. For a dose of 0.5 gray in an approximately 30 kilo base single stranded virus genome, about 0.005 single stranded breaks per virus are expected. By contrast, any antiviral drug treatment against SARS-CoV-2 would probably result in a more intense selection pressure on the virus and new resistant variants. One of the most important questions to be answered at present is the optimal therapeutic window for the use of low-dose radiation therapy. While usage at early stages of the disease may negatively impact on the host viral immune and early inflammatory response, a late application of the treatment may lose the capacity for the treatment to scope with serious mechanisms like acute respiratory distress syndrome or cytokine storm or organ failure. At present, transition from viral pulmonary phases to hyperinflammatory phases is believed to cover the best hypothetical therapeutic window of opportunity. In conclusion, findings from the clinical studies reported so far indicate an effectiveness of LDRT in treatment COVID-19 patients up to 90%. Accordingly, LDRD can be a feasible treatment in this patient's group. Indeed, the American Food and Drug Administration recently accepted LDRT to treat pneumonia as a strong 
approach to reduce mortality in these patients. Main limitations, however, of this studies include low sample sizes, unjustified doses, lack of markers for patient selections, and the use of therapeutic drugs that may cover confounding or interventing variables not addressed so far. And in this and with this statement, I'd like to thank you for your attention and will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rodell. Uh, could you speak more about the clinical, the, the FDA approval for low-dose radiation therapy for pneumonia? So most of this clinical trials, as I've reported before, uh, were, were performed in the USA. And accordingly there, uh, the FDA approved this low dose radiotherapy indeed for the treatment of this uh, severe uh, ill patients. Okay, thank you. Let me see here. I've got a number of questions coming in. Um, where uh, Where is the best place to get the metho methodology to perform physical calculations of these doses? So most of the clinical studies that I have reported on were based on a CD scan of the patients before treatment in a linear, uh, linear accelerators. And in some cases, uh, also the patients were uh, have performed a, a treatment planning. Others only used a, a bilateral uh, dose distribution to, to the lung. Um, for the patients, and in most cases, also there was a single uh, dose irradiation and a fractionated irradiation of the patients. So the best way to to treat the patients in most studies that have been performed were performed by linear accelerator in the departments of radiotherapy with the um, appropriate expertise of the medical physics experts to perform the adequate irradiation of the lungs of the patients. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, is the dose larger than 0.5 gray justified in the treatment of pneumonia? Um, as Professor Geibel, for example, uh, reported before, uh, to my point of view, and his point of view, the best dose at present is treatment with 0 0.5 gray. However, we had to wait for, for the publication of the studies that use higher doses concerning 1 gray or 1.5 gray. So at present, you can't judge whether 0 0.5 gray is the best dose. However, from the first publications and from the first studies, it seems so that 0 0.5 gray is the best dose to treat the patients with this uh, COVID-19 associated pneumonia. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, can we use low-dose RT for COVID-related mucormycosis? Uh, to be honest, I do not have an experience on that, and I'm not aware on any publications or any studies to, to address this question. So at present, I can't answer this question. Um, I can't answer this question now. Okay. Next question. Is it feasible to irradiate COVID patients while on a ventilator? This is, this is also confirmed by the, by the study. This is not in favor of the low-dose radiotherapy of COVID-19 patients. If the patients require mechanical ventilation, they're in a late state of the disease. And this early state, late state of disease, I think they are a full-blown um, disease. And in this case, the low-dose radiotherapy will know have no impact on, on, on the clinical side. So this is confirmed by, by the last part that I've shown you that patients that require mechanical ventilation, this is a too late time point for, for irradiation of this patient. So um, as I also stated before, um, the best point, uh, the best time for, for irradiation has to be uh, um, developed in, in clinical studies, but um, very, very late irradiation in patients that, are, uh, that require mechanical ventilation to my point of view is too too late for the treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, what was the prescription depth for planning? So most of the studies um, did uh, perform the clinical target volume for the whole uh, lungs and um, so they do not uh, uh, describe or contour some special um, structures in, in the lungs, so it's mainly described on, on the whole lungs. Uh, in some in some reports, they try to perform a treatment planning and to spare the the um, bone marrow or the the, the 
of a spinal cord of the patients, but most uh, of the patients that are treated were treated with a very simple uh, treatment planning and treatment um, um, geometry of the patients. Okay. Um, next question is regarding details um, with the ethnicity of the study patients. Do you have any data specifically on Asian patients? Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there are no um, clinical studies or reports uh, given so far from Asian uh, patients. So most of the studies were performed in USA, some in Europe, in, in Spain, and um, some in Switzerland. But to, my, to the best of my knowledge, there is no clinical study uh, that addresses the um, gender, uh, the, the um, and the question whether there is a difference between the European American or Asian population. Okay, um, next question. Uh, this attendee had commented that at their center, they're treating APPA2D plan for a lung bath of 50 uh, centigrade. Do you think that CT planning would have made a lot of dosimetric benefit? Um. I'm not a radiophysicist, I'm a radiobiologist, so it's quite difficult for me to answer that question in, in detail. Uh, but to my point, if you think that the dose um, requirement for, for a CT scan before this treatment is so low that it does not really impact on, on, on the treatment uh, of the patients, even if you treat with a dose of 0 0.5 gray. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodell. That is the final question for your section. Um, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Richard Schaffer. Uh, he will be presenting our, our final session of today's uh, section on low-dose radiation therapy for calcinodynia, uh, indications, technique, and clinical results. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Schaffer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Schaffer. I'm a clinical oncologist. I'm clinical lead for benign and skin radiotherapy for Genesis Care UK and medical director of Extral. I'm going to talk today about radiotherapy for heel pain. So in summary, I'm going to do an introduction to heel pain and its diagnosis, talk about general treatment, treatment options, talk about whether radiotherapy works at all, and if so, what dose? And then we'll talk about how to do it and then a summary at the end. So plantar fasciitis is the most common cause of plantar heel pain, but there is a differential diagnosis. So for instance, there are local diagnoses such as heel fat pad atrophy, calcaneal stress fracture and tibial nerve entrapment. There can also be referred pain with S1 radiculopathy or systemic diagnoses such as rheumatoid arthritis. And although most plantar fasciitis is at the insertion, it's not all there. So Young in 2012 did an ultrasound scan um, in patients who've had plantar fasciitis for more than six months. He found that 66% of patients did have insertional disease, but 34% had distal fascia disease, and some actually had fibromas. So there are various words that are used in the literature. So calcaneodynia, which really just means heel pain, and that really would be a clinical diagnosis. Heels first syndrome, which would imply an X-ray diagnosis, and plantar fasciitis, which is either clinical or sometimes imaging, looking at the plantar fascia thickness with ultrasound or MRI. So these things have different implications, but often when we treat patients, sometimes there's no formal diagnosis. And there is the issue, does the specific diagnosis even matter? I mean, a lot of the time, they're unified by inflammation, and really, radiotherapy is used as an anti-inflammatory um, at low doses. So in this talk, because the literature varies a little, I'm going to use heel pain, calcaneodynia, and plantar fasciitis interchangeably. So just to talk a little bit more about plantar fasciitis. So it's a strain, tears, degeneration, and a lot of people use the word plantar fasciopathy instead of fasciitis. It occurs in around 10% of the population, and particularly in, in people between the ages of 40 to 60 years old. The causes of mechanical overloads, so for instance, obesity, intense exercise, or poor footwear. 80% resolved by 12 months with conservative measures. 
And so really, when we're looking at considering other treatments, that's for resistant plants to fasciitis, where they've not resolved with conservative measures. So if we talk about the overall treatment options, so conservative measures include resting, weight loss, icing, stretching, changing the footwear, orthotics and night spins. Once you've done that, talking about other treatments, so often people have steroid injections, but I have to say, we, we feel that they, they have short-term relief only, and there are, of course, risks involved. We'll talk about radiotherapy, of course, in some detail. PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, um, this certainly does have an effect, but it's quite slow acting, and it is shown to be better than steroids. Uh, extracorporeal shockwave treatment is widely available, but it can be effective in some patients, but it, there is quite inconsistent evidence. Surgery really should be considered as a last resort if non-surgical treatments fail. So let's talk about radiotherapy. Does it work at all? Well, Austin in 2013 looked at all the studies looking at over 13,000 patients and found the response rate overall of 85%. So that certainly implies that it works. And there have been three randomized trials of radiotherapy versus other treatments. So I'm going to talk about those in some detail. But just to listen, the Nevold trial was radiotherapy with a standard dose of six gram, six fractions versus 0.6 gram, six fractions. Now, there are some that might consider that to be a control, although in the paper they say they do not consider it to be a control. Canyon Maths um, in 2014 looked at radiotherapy versus a steroid injection. And again, perhaps one could consider that as a control. And Gonya in 2016 looked at three gray um, of radiotherapy in six fractions versus PRP. So let's talk about these in some detail. So the eligibility for the trials was of fasciitis for at least six months and failed conservative management. Um, the workup and diagnostics differed a little. They all said they wanted to have an x-ray. Canyon Mouse and Newbold wanted it as proof of a heel spur, and Gonya said that they wanted to rule out other causes. Newbold wanted an orthopedic consult um, to rule out other causes, and Gonya also had an ultrasound scan to look at the plantar fascia thickness. And radiotherapy was given between two and three times a week. So Nevold, it was a standard dose of radiotherapy, six grade six fractions, versus a very low dose, 0.1 grade fraction times six. And the low dose treatment was assumed to be insufficient for pain relief, which is why I say perhaps one could see it as a control. Um, the mean age was 56 years, all had to be over 40 years um, in terms of the eligibility for the trial. Mean duration of pain was 17 months, and more than 90% of patients found that sports and leisure was limited or impossible. If there was a poor response at 12 weeks, then the patient was re-irradiated with a standard dose of treatment. Although, if the patient had failed, then they remained in their dose group they started off as, with the results classified as unsatisfactory. On the interim analysis, there was a clear difference in response, so the trial was closed at that point to further improvement. Now, let's have a look at the, the um, results. So, the VAS, the visual analog scale out of 100, so zero being zero pain, low pain, 100 being the worst pain imaginable. And they started off both of them as 60 out of 100, roughly. At three months, you can see that the standard dose had gone down to 19, and the low dose, so 0.6 gray, had gone down to 41. So clearly there was much more change in the visual analog scale than the standard dose of radiotherapy. But interestingly, also, 64% uh, of the low dose patients wanted re-irradiation, whereas only 17% of the patients who received standard dose radiotherapy wanted re-irradiation, re and also the effects were durable at four years. So it really, it's a, the message of this trial is standard six-grade radiotherapy is better than very low-dose radiotherapy. Um, so coming on to the next trial, Canyon Mass, this was radiotherapy versus steroid injections. Radiotherapy was given the six-grade and six fractions over two to three weeks. Very similar baseline characteristics to the, uh, the Nevold trial. And again, if there was poor response at 12 weeks, then they were offered further treatment of the patient's choice. So not necessarily radiotherapy. The visual analog scale was done out of 10. Again, zero being zero, uh, no pain, 10 being the worst pain. And the radiotherapy group was a little worse to start with. But you can see there was approximately double the reduction in pain with radiotherapy 
compared to the steroids. And also, the, if you add up the complete and the substantial response in the radiotherapy group, there was um, a 68% complete plus substantial response, whereas steroid only has a 28% uh, response. So therefore, the conclusion of this one is that radiotherapy is better than the steroid injection. Now, the GONIA trial is a little different. This was radiotherapy versus um, PRP. Um, and the radiotherapy was given with uh, three gray and six fractions, which we'll see later is a, a very reasonable dose. But in fact, they were very different patients. These were sports people. Um, their mean age was much less than the other trials. So remember, it was around 56 uh, years old on average. These were 28 years old. And they also were just very fit. And if you look at their baseline characteristics, again, visual analog score out of 10 was uh, 6.5, 6.6, similar in both groups. Um, and they had a very similar change, actually. So really, on all the general measures, including plus fascia thickness on the ultrasound, there was really no significant difference in response. So therefore, radiotherapy and PRP are equivalent, but I've also said in young athletes. Um, so would that also apply to your normal patient? Maybe, but maybe not. So coming on to some of the details about radiotherapy, what fraction size and what total dose would you use? So there have been various trials looking at this. Sieg and Schmidt compared five gray and 10 fractions, which was better than three gray and 10 fractions, which was better than two times six gray and six fractions. So therefore 0.5 gray times 10 seemed to be the best regime that he used. Hayes looked at three gray and six fractions versus six gray and six fractions and found them to be equal. Ott also found the same, three grain six fractions, equivalent to six grain six fractions, i.e. 0.5 grain per fraction is equivalent to one grain um, fraction. And Niewold and Procaine found also that if you try to um, give the same total dose, six grain, in six fractions or 12 fractions, really they're the same. So therefore, overall from those trials, we can see that the standard dose should be considered to be three grain six fractions, over two to three weeks, with each fraction being 0.5 gray. The next question is, should you give one phase of three gray and six fractions or two phases? Now, if you look at the um, response in the OT trial from 2013-14, then you can see the baseline they started at around 6.5, uh, about uh, 65 out of 100. After the first series, they went down slightly. Uh, 12 weeks later, they went down slightly more. If they gave a second series, then they did have an early response. The delayed response was six weeks later when they responded further. And then long term of 32 months, they responded further. So you can see that there was better pain relief after two phases and after one phase. However, it might mean there would have been more pain relief if you would have just waited without giving the second series. And therefore, really, you shouldn't assess whether they need the second phase too early. So really, if you wait for about three or four months, see the patient, see if they've had either a complete or a really good partial response. If they've not had that, you could offer a second phase. But if they've had good pain response at that time, then they may well not need a second phase. You can save that radiotherapy dose. So how do we do it? Well, using a LINAC, um, on the left is one of my patients. You can see you include the whole calcaneus and the plantar fascia. It's fairly similar to um, uh, what was treated on the trials. Um, I use six, um, uh, six MV of post-lateral fields, dose, dose prescribed at the midpoint. If you're doing it with ortho voltage, um, 200 to 250 kV, it's a direct field, plus a direct field, generally around six to eight centimeters, but that can be modified. And you put some bolus laterally and dorsally using what's called the Essen technique. You can calculate the dose to five millimeter depth. So, in conclusion, radiotherapy is 85% effective in the treatment of heel pain. It should be considered if conservative treatments have failed for at least three to six months. The standard dose is three gray and six fractions over two to three weeks. And you can consider a second phase of radiotherapy if there's insufficient pain relief at three months. And it can be delivered either with a LINAP or ortho voltage check. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Schaffer. Um, Dr. Schaffer, uh, the, the question here is regarding extral, and it, do we provide a, a kind of a 
non-radiation therapy mode or a, a sham mode on any of our devices. Um, I'm actually not aware if we do or don't. Um, we have another specialist on the line from Extral, Amanda Talk, who's our chief science officer who might be able to take that one. Yeah, Christy, I don't believe we do, but I agree that Amanda might be able to talk to that. Uh... We don't. <laughs> yeah, hello audience. No, we don't. We only provide all of our devices emit x-rays, so they can do low-dose radiation, but they are all actually radiation-emitting systems, correct? Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, next question, um, Dr. Schaffer, what about giving radiation during consecutive days? Um, well, that's certainly not how the trials have given radiation, um, and so if we're looking at the evidence, then that would not be the way that one would do it. Um, I think in terms of why that is, I would probably want to hand over to our other experts who've been talking about mechanisms and radiobiology. But certainly if you're following the clinical data, then no, that's not what you would do. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions for, for you. Um, what is the youngest age you would radiate for plantar fasciitis? Um, well, I would follow the DEGRO guidelines, and generally I wouldn't consider patients under the age of 40. Um, I have to say, though, you know, having treated a lot of patients with benign conditions with low-dose radiation, um, my view over time has changed a little. Um, I used to only treat the older patients, but, you know, from my point of view, if you're dealing with adults who are able to make informed consent decisions, then they are able to weigh up the, um, the pros and the cons of uh, having you know, one treatment or another treatment. And certainly patients who have, do not have any other treatment modalities left apart from surgery, who are significantly disabled, I would certainly have an open discussion with someone, even if they're a little below the age of 40. Uh, but generally, that would be my, my view. Okay, this is a similar question sort of to follow on. Um, how conservative is your approach um, before you, you try radiation therapy? Do you use other conservative techniques prior so to that, radiation? So I think it's good practice to make sure that, you, you know, the conservative approach has really been done well. Um, and so I do question the patients about what they've actually done. Um, because, you know, a patient might have had pains for six months and just rested a bit or just iced it. But I really want them to have undergone uh, a good exercise program, potentially to have orthotics, to have thought about changing their footwear. You know, depending on what the problem is, perhaps they might need to lose some weight. And, and I also feel that during and after the radiation, if they want to have the best chance of it working, they should continue to do uh, those things. Uh, for instance, if there's a clear problem with their gait, they should get full gait analysis and have uh, you know, orthotics to correct that. So I think the conservative treatment is really important in terms of eligibility for radiotherapy, but also uh, it makes sense to, to make sure that it's covered um, you know, during and after radiotherapy as well. Okay, um, next question. What cancer risk do you quote for three gray? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I quote um, a cancer risk depending on age. Um, so if a patient were over the age of 60 or so, really I say I think the cancer risk is negligible. Um, if someone is 50 years old, I would normally quote a one in a thousand lifetime risk of cancer, uh, really based on the risk mainly of basal cell carcinoma of the skin we're treating um, a, a foot. Um, I, I think I'm being very conservative in the way that I express that. I'd be interested in knowing what the other, other panelists say, but um, you know, I'd rather overestimate rather than underestimate. Okay, uh, we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, two more questions. How do you stabilize the foot? Do you use any fixation of any kind? Um, I think, you know, keep the patient comfortable and comfortably immobilize the patient. So we would just use uh, a sandbag or a vacuum. 
Okay, and final question um, regarding additional resources on this subject uh, besides the information that we're presenting over the course of the next three days. Um, do you have any atlas of books that you would recommend on this subject? Uh, absolutely. There, there is um, a textbook on the uh, radiotherapy for uh, non-malignant conditions that, from my point of view, is, has got a lot of information about a very wide range of, of conditions. So, you know, that's the main resource. I think uh, the Degro papers and guidelines are very helpful as well. Um, and then obviously the, uh, the particular references that we've quoted during the presentations. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Schaffer. Um, also, thank you to the rest of today's panelists. And with that, I'll go ahead and conclude today's session. Thank you so much.